Hey, aloha and welcome to Stanley Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii on another absolutely gorgeous June day here in Hawaii. You gotta love it. Nice trade winds blowing, keeping everything cool. And I'd like to start off the show by thanking the folks over on Maui with the, um, that put together the Hawaii State um, County Association um, event at the Wailea uh, Resort. Awesome conference. We had uh, their, their theme was sustainability. And uh, they truly stayed focused on it and had some great speakers, great panels, great presenters, uh, and a, a preview of even uh, one of the films at the Maui Film Festival, which is going on right now. So if you're lucky enough to be over on Maui no Kauai, check out the film festival as well. Some great stuff going on. But uh, thanks again to Kelly King and Bob King and all the folks from Maui who put that on. It was a, a really outstanding first-class conference. So our guest today comes to us from the Pacific Northwest, home of the totem poles and, and uh, northern Kwakutl Indians, as it were. And um, he's, uh, he's been to Hawaii several times, been on the show several times, um, been on uh, the Wednesday Energy Show with Jay uh, once or twice. Um, he's got some great ideas. He's a poet. He's a, an artist. He's a piano player. He's a man about town and, uh, and a traveling fool. And um, just tried pizza, pizza baking for a while too. But Toby Kincaid is coming to us live from uh, from the Big Big Island over in uh, in Washington State, I think. Is it Washington or Oregon, Toby? Where are you at? Oregon, Portland. Oh, Oregon. Okay, Portland. Sorry, <laughs> I get all those I get all those northwestern cities screwed up because uh, we call it there. Cascadia. Okay, Cascadia. <laughs> it's I'll just region. use that Cascadia. But anyway, thanks for being on the show today, Toby. And uh, I know we got a lot to catch up on. But why don't you start off by letting the audience know who you are, because they may not have seen our earlier shows. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's a, it's an honor. And if I may, I'd like to take a moment. I, I understand you're retiring soon. And I would like to say publicly, thank you so much for your tenure at HCAT. You have been a bright light in advocating where many people don't want to go, and that is asking the real questions. How do we actually become clean? And uh, I, I admire you greatly, and you've been a tremendous inspiration to me, and I know to others. So thank you for all your great work and uh, many more to come. Bless your uh, heart. Thanks, Toby, for the kind words. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm often referred to as the fecal matter in the punch bowl. Uh, by being brutally honest, so thanks for thanks for actually laying a couple of flowers on me there, and uh, I appreciate the compliment. Well, I'm happy to join you in that in that punch bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I go way back in clean energy, and and that gives me a perspective to appreciate what you do. And uh, I started as an optics lab, and we were looking at solar energy and and the different parts. You have infrared, invisible, and ultraviolet. But we normally think of sunlight as one thing, sunlight. But actually, Newton showed us that sunlight is really 17 different things. It, it depends on the frequency and the wavelength. And so my early work was in trying to leverage solar cells optically. And uh, that led me on a long path of doing projects uh, really all over the world. I've been in 17 countries. And it, it's just amazing to see solar energy really work for people and change their lives. So we're kind of all living under the under a lie that we have to burn carbon. It's just not true. We, we don't need carbon at all. And as you have uh, know and have been and advocating that the energy is actually in the hydrogen, not in the carbon that it's stuck to. So I, uh, it's kind of led me on this path. The last uh, five or six years, I've been doing a lot of work in the EV charging space. So assisting in, in designing the site plans, the layouts, the regulatory affairs, doing all the permitting to actually put in the infrastructure uh, to do fast charge. And uh, it's uh, a big ambition, of course, to convert away from the piston engines of 1882 and kind of enter the 21st century and realize that fuel cells and electrolyzers and hydrogen as the working fluid, as the energy carrier, is absolutely uh, superior. And I intend to make that, that case as we apply it to actually uh, EV charging stations and infrastructure for uh, getting us decarbonized. I think there's two issues that we recognize locally that are kind of holding back EV charging stations. Well, three things actually. Uh, number one is cost. Um, number two is you're still connected to a fossil fuel grid. 
Um, so in many cases, even though you're charging your, your clean powered car, you're charging it off of a fossil fuel burning grid. And um, the last thing is um, just the, the permitting issues that are connected with connecting to the, to the grid. Um, when you connect to a public utility, you have all kind of permitting uh, requirements by the, the utility, by the PUC, by the county, um, and sometimes by the state to get things done. So um, I think some of your, your ideas and your plans are just, they're, they're great because they take away some of that complexity by using pure renewable energy to make clean electricity and then charge vehicles from that. And it actually is a much faster, more efficient, much cleaner process. Absolutely. And it is the future. And uh, it's the only way that our children's children are going to survive. And we have to take this seriously. Uh, you know, a few days ago, it was 55 degrees here. In the last couple of days, it's been 97. You know, when you dump 30 billion metric tons of carbon into the atmosphere year after year, decade after decade, uh, we're going to see these expressions. So the stakes couldn't be higher. We're literally talking about the future of, uh, of uh, humanity and being able to operate with so many people and have something decent as a lifestyle. So it's, it's vital what you're doing, and, and uh, it's uh, an honor to play some little part, if I can. Uh, if I may, maybe we could uh, jump into the slides, and I can, I'll can i give you a little bit of a, uh, an update of what's going on in, uh, in the charging station space. Great. Great. We'll throw up the first uh, image, and uh, we'll get going with that one. Okay, you know, last, uh, during our last episode, I was telling you about a patent I filed for a multimodal charging station. And so when you write a patent and then you file a patent, the next thing is to build some hardware so you can justify why you went to the trouble to write it. You know, here's the benefit. So you can see this is a little test we did. I put together uh, my arrays and wired them in through my controller. And I have an e-bike there and I put a little rig together. Just to, This is not the commercial product. This is just to throw something up and let's do a test. Let's find out how far can we go charging uh, e-bikes with solar energy. And, you know, when I, when I first put it together, you know, I had a full charge on my e-bike and I wired up my plugs. You know, I checked it about eight times and I thought, you know, when I plug this in, if I'm wrong, it's going to blow up in my face. So I kind of cringed to put my glasses on it. Oh, great. Nothing happened. Worked. So the next day we did the test. So I put out the, the e-bike the, the day before I ran it down to zero. You know, these e-bikes are really fun. You, it doesn't have a throttle like a motorcycle. You just pedal forward and it senses that and then boosts you. And you can choose the mode one, which is very little boost, to mode five, which is maximum boost. I chose mode five. And, and I rode down. It took me three hours to get the battery down to zero for my test. But I finally got it down to zero. So the next day I plugged it in, uh, let it charge all day. And then the next morning, unplugged it and then uh, everything settled down, uh, jumped on the bike, set the odometer and the trip meter and took off. And the question was, how far can I go? Well, when I got to around eight miles, I thought, well, if I get to 10, eh, that's a C. Uh, when I got to 10, I said, well, if I can get to 13, then maybe that's a B. I, I'm more happy with that. Past 13. I said, okay, if I get to 15, that's an A. Well, we went 21 miles. Wow. And it's amazing, you know, I'm kind of a girthy guy to get on a bike and to haul me up those hills. I was very impressed. So the, the, the idea of actually hooking solar panels up to uh, e-bikes, uh, I couldn't find any data. So using the controller I designed and, and the wiring, uh, it worked. So I was pretty about that. So that's a step. Yeah, you know, over at the Maui conference that just came from, they had a, a couple guys talking about e-bikes and you know, they actually have a, a company over there that rents e-bikes to tourists, and uh, they're, very, they're very active in opening up bike paths and making them available to the bicyclist. But everybody that talked about e-bikes, you know, they asked the question, how many of you folks have ridden an, an e-bike? Not a regular bike, but an e-bike. And not very many people stuck their hands up, and they said, you got to try this. It's actually a game changer. Um, if, if we had e-bikes in a lot of the cities, people probably wouldn't bother with their cars. Uh, because they're really, they, you know, you can drive to work and not be all sweaty. You can, you know, you, you can be a lady in a decently dressed up and, and not be uh, pedaling like crazy and, and, and having your makeup smear and everything. You can actually get to, to and from work and are all around town with an e-bike. And it's, it's actually uh, a, a lot of fun. They really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to jumping on an e-bike here soon. 
Oh, it'll surprise you. I mean, when you go up the hill, just as you said, you normally get all sweaty and you don't want to go to work when you're sweaty. Often there's no showers. And, but if you have an e-bike, you can just kind of pedal up the hill and it takes you right up there. And I thought, oh, this is really good. <laughs> so the idea that I'm trying to develop is to merge the station with the e-bike. So now we have a package. And actually, if you want to jump to the next slide, I'll show you, show you the next iteration. Uh, the station I had before had kind of a vertical axis and that was fine for a test. But when you're in the tropics, really, we're going to swing that panel up. So you can see kind of the rig. I've got a little solar canopy and a little mounting hardware. And then you have your e-bike there. And it has the little uh, plug-in and the little latch so that when you slide it in, it locks in and it aligns the charging plug. And uh, there you go. So with your smartphone, you just go up like uh, we have here in Portland with the kick scooters. You just scan the QR code and uh, it unlocks the bike and you're ready to go. And I would like to put these stations really at almost every bus stop. So now we can reimagine what a bus stop is, which hasn't changed in 100 years, just a pole with a plaque on it. Now we can add these charging stations, and then people have these options. Do you want to take a scooter? Do you want to take an e-bike? Or, you know, you can still take the bus. So that's how I see the future, is a distributed network of these charging stations. And uh, it's 100% clean energy today. Yeah, and you know, we have uh, we've had a couple of uh, experiences here with um, the uh, the bikes. Uh, uh, excuse me, the scooters that you can just pick up and zoom around with, and and then lay them down, and, and right. somebody can pick them up. And then we have uh, like hoverboards, the little mono wheel things where people are driving around. And uh, quite frankly, they're a little scary for me because bicycles have a pretty set protocol with you know. They drive with the, the same in the same lane, the same direction as traffic, and there's bike lanes that are pretty well understood, and they follow the same traffic signals as the cars. But I, I tell you, when you when you have some of these guys on electric skateboards or electric scooters, they come zooming down sidewalks, and and I fear for some of the pedestrians. And I I see some of these guys try and make the crosswalk before the light changes, and they don't make it. And I'm I'm afraid one of these days a car is going to take off and not see them coming and, and pull out right in front of one of these guys or, or smack into them because they're for their that size vehicle and they're going too fast and they usually don't have protective headgear on or anything and you know people don't realize you, you go much more than 10 miles an hour you're you're actually speeding a human being doesn't run 10 miles an hour at least not guys like you and me for sure but um even premier athletes they're they don't press those kind of speeds and you can get badly hurt you know, stop and go to a dead stop at uh, 15 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. And these people on these skateboards and stuff, they don't, they don't realize how badly they can get beat up. And they're mixing in with pedestrians during rush hour and people try to get home. But the e-bikes, they, they, they fit in really well. I, I really like the way they fit. Well, I very much agree. You know, the little kick scooters, they have very small wheels. And if you hit a pothole, they can turn on you and you're, you're, you're you know, end over tea kettle. Yeah. So it, it is yeah. dangerous. In Portland, you have, you're supposed to wear a helmet and you're supposed to not be on the sidewalk. But many people don't really follow the rules. And then the idea of this dockless idea where you drop the bike anywhere you want, I just see that as really very disorganized. Also, the ADA, the American Disability Act, uh, doesn't really allow you to drop things in the sidewalk if it can block a, a wheelchair access. So there's a lot of issues with just this dockless wild west, use the bike, throw it where you want, or the little scooter. So I completely agree with you. That's from a safety standpoint, the e-bikes have the big normal bike tires and you can really go through pretty rough rides and, and not be tipped over. Right. So uh, absolutely, the e-bike I think is a better way to go. Mine is a multimodal charging station, so we can charge both the scooters and e-bikes, but I'm with you. I think the e-bike is a more comfortable, safer, faster way to, to move people uh, out of cars. Hey, so we're going to take a quick break here, and then we're going to come back and let you zoom through the rest of your slides. And uh, we'll see you in okay. 60 seconds. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, 
I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show, and it's streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man, Stan Osterman here on my lunch hour as usual, talking to Toby Kincaid over in Portland. And uh, we're talking about uh, a really neat concept of um, plug-in chargers for e-bikes that use solar power. So Toby, let's get back to you and uh, jump into some more of your images there. No, oh, wonderful. Uh, the next image, uh, if you bring it up, is the uh, a charging station that we do. This is a DC fast charge station. This just opened in Hillsborough, Oregon. This photo is, uh, I think, is still under construction when this was taken. But you can see the pedestals here. This was designed and built by EV Global, Hans Vandermeer, uh, probably the most brilliant engineer I know. Uh, he's incredible. He knows everything about fast charging cars. Uh, he designed and built this station. And I wanted to show you the little pedestals, how, how kind of uh, lovely they are. They're very slender and nice. Now these are fast charge, so each one is 50 kilowatts. Wow. And that's quite a bit of power. Yeah. Uh, it's about equal to 10 homes, if you think of a five kilowatt house. So each dispenser is 50 kilowatts, and we use four of those. We add a couple of level two chargers, but uh, really it's four fast charge stations that are kind of the focus. And that requires, because there's four at 50 kilowatts, a 200 kilowatt transformer. Now this is all state of the art, and in the last picture you can see the uh, where the the power conditioning equipment is in the cabinets. You can't really connect a dispenser to the grid at this level, because the grid comes into a parking lot usually through a primary. And you locate where that is, and then you can trench or bore the power into the transformer, then into the power conditioning equipment, and then out to the dispensers. So these are lovely stations. I would very much like to install uh, fast charge stations in Hawaii, but. As you point out, there are a few challenges. So uh, if we go to the next slide, I can, I can go into that. So when I look at Oahu, and forgive my artwork there, there's a circle that says Oahu in it, uh, you have nearly, to the best information I have, uh, nearly a million cars on Oahu, a million cars and trucks. Now these are all piston engines. The EV part that you have, the best numbers I could get are about 5,500. Uh, so that's about half of 1% of your fleet today. Uh, you have existing on the island about 350 level two chargers. Uh, level two is slower than fast charge, takes about six hours to charge your car at that level. But if you're parking and, and this is uh, destination charging, so you don't go to a gas station, you park where you're going, to the parking lot, and that's where you're gonna charge. So you've got 350 of those. You've got about six fast charge stations that I could find. Those are public stations, I think owned and operated by HECO. Uh, I'm not going to speak to Tesla. I think they have their own private network. They run at 140 kilowatts, so it's kind of a supercharger. Yeah. Uh, but most of the state of the art at fast charge is 50 kilowatts. And so when we look at that, uh, uh, that last graphic, we can see that there are some serious challenges. Uh, so if I use, in, in planning the, the charging stations, if I use the ratio of if we look at 1%, for example, of your coming fleet, that's 10,000 EVs. Now there's 16 EVs per charging station. So we need 625 charging stations to service 1% of your fleet. So, and how many of those will be fast charge? Well, here's where the, where the rubber meets the road. Um, I put a little uh, one fast charge station, 20, and then 200. Uh, the issue is, when you plug in a DC fast charge dispenser to the grid, we're going to draw 50 kW per dispenser. So we're going to draw 200 kilowatts at any time, any one time, if everyone is using the charger. Now, there is uh, the way that electricity is charged uh, nowadays in utilities is they charge you in two ways. They charge you for the electricity that you use, the usage, the kilowatt hours, but they also charge you for the delivery called a demand charge. And under the schedule in Hawaii, if you're a large electricity consumer, you pay about 15 cents for the kilowatt hour. But under Schedule P, you're going to pay $26 a kilowatt. 
So every month they're gonna measure what is the maximum power you drew for a 15 minute period, and that's gonna be your demand charge. Well, now I'm starting to run into some trouble here because if I connect fast charge to the grid, I'm going to have a 200 kilowatt demand. And I do the math, that's about $5,200 a month. So if I were gonna do 200 stations, I would have a demand charge of, of a little over a million dollars every four weeks. Uh, that's difficult to, uh, when I run through scenarios and I look at how many you know, charges we can do, what's the cost of energy, what's the cost of my hardware, I really run into a wall here. So uh, we, it's very clear now, and even if we look at the renewable energy and clean energy in general, we're, we're reaching the point where the utilities at certain times of the day have too much solar for a particular area, and uh, now they're asking people to turn it off. In fact, if you put a solar system in, you need a disconnect switch by the utility so they can curtail you and turn you off because the grid is instantaneous. It, the demand has to equal the supply and the supply has to equal the demand. Demand goes up, supply goes up. Demand goes down, supply goes down. So if I plug in 200 kilowatts of fast charge, I'm drawing 200 kilowatts. I've got a $5,000 demand charge. And if I do 200 stations, it's a million bucks a month. And before I paid for the station or the energy. So this was really uh, uh, stymied me for a while. But the answer is clear. We need a battery. And most energy experts who talk about grid balancing and, and, and the ability to balance the load uh, to the supply and peaker stations, it's very complicated. But everyone agrees we need a battery so we can separate and divorce the load. So let's look at my station. I have four 50 kilowatt dispensers. I need 200 kilowatts and I need to do that for five hours because between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. That's the peak of your utility. I don't want to charge during the peak, but I certainly don't want to tell a customer, hey, you mind charging earlier in the day or after? No, no, no. People charge the car when they want to charge the car. So I've got to separate it. And so the key is the battery. Well, Sounds fine. Why don't I just get a battery and everybody's happy? Well, batteries are expensive. Uh, the cost has come down. In, in 2011, the cost of a kilowatt hour for a lithium ion battery was about $1,000. Now they push that down to $300. That's great. But the rest of the pushing it further is going to be a little more difficult because they're kind of reaching the max of what they can get. So when I look at doing my battery, I can calculate what I need. I need 200 kilowatts for five hours. That's a thousand kilowatt hours. So what, what's, uh, uh, what's that going to, uh, to cost and how are we going to do it with the battery? Well, if I look for a lithium ion battery at $300 a kilowatt hour, now I'm looking at $300,000 per site for the battery. Well, I, I look at that and I run the projections, I run the numbers and, I, and there's no way I can do it. So on one end, I can't buy the energy directly because of my demand charge. The other end, I can't afford the battery so I can separate the demand charge. So I looked at that and, and started to remember what you have been talking about for many years and looked back again at hydrogen and went, wait a second, let's look at the physics here. One kilogram, 2.2 pounds of lithium ion, of lithium, that will store about 300 watt hours of energy. Fine. Hydrogen of the same mass, one kilogram, will store 40,000 watt hours. So I look at that and went, wait a second here. Let's, uh, and we can go to the next picture. Let's take a look. What would a hydrogen fueling station look like? And not first, not just actually selling the hydrogen. I'm using the hydrogen internally as a battery because it's an ideal energy carrier. In fact, it's the best energy carrier known to science. Mm -hmm. So when I do the layout, you can see I'm, I'm looking for a, where to put my gear in a parking lot. I see a little uh, landscaped area, measure it out. Okay, I can put it there. I'm not showing where the, the energy comes in from the vault, but I have a blue line from the water main. I can bring the water in, bring it to the electrolyzer and make hydrogen and then use the hydrogen when I'm off the peak time or when I'm during peak time and use that to actually energize the 50 kilowatt fast charge dispensers. So at the moment, I'm not dispensing hydrogen. I'm just using it internally. 
And what's amazing is to get to a thousand kilowatt hours, I only need 25 kilograms, maybe 30 of hydrogen. That's very manageable. So if I look at the size of a, a thousand kilowatt hour lithium pack, that's like 10 cars stacked side by side because each car is about a hundred kilowatt hours. How am I going to put that in a parking lot? I, yeah. I can't. But when I look at the hydrogen footprint, I can't believe it. It is incredibly competitive. In fact, so now I can use an electrolyzer and only draw 50 kilowatts store the energy on board. And then when I want to run 200 kilowatts, I just run that through the fuel cell. I have a 200 kilowatt stack of four 50 kilowatt fuel cells. The energy comes out and charges, and then I get a lot of water, which I then recycle, which will go into the next slide, which is, which is how do I design the system? And so here's what I've come up with. This is actually, every component is known. Every component is commercial. I can buy every part of this, I just can't buy this. <laughs> so I looked at this and it kind of went, my goodness, you know, we, we have electrolyzers, we have fuel cells. So why not combine it all into a whole system? So now instead of drawing 200 KW, I only draw 50. I draw it from nine o'clock at night all the way to four in the afternoon. So I don't touch the peak. And uh, most importantly, I can take the most valuable resource that you have and that is all of the clean energy you're turning off. Yep. Curtailed energy is a huge problem that the oversupply and there's nothing to do with it. They got to do something with it. So the only thing they can do is turn it off because if you have too much energy in a circuit, it's going to try and find a way to ground and that's dangerous. It's called the arc flash. So it is very important for the safety of everyone that we keep the grid in balance. And so now by studying what we could do with all this equipment, and knowing exactly the battery that I need, it kind of was a, oh my goodness moment. It just jumped out of the page. And, and if you slapped me with a wet towel, it would have been a tickle. I was like, oh, oh I well, Toby, found a particular application. <laughs> well, Toby, now that we got so, your attention with hydrogen and you've, you've figured out how valuable it really is, um, I'm looking for the next set of patents you come out with. But uh, believe it or not, we blasted through 30 minutes talking to you. And, oh, no, uh, we don't yeah. want to. Oh. And so we're going to have to come, have you I come have back. I have so many on. other charts I want to show you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Plus, you got to write at least one more poem before I'll let you back on the show so you can read it out loud. But uh, <laughs> hey, you mentioned I'll be retiring. I'll be retiring end of July, but I still plan to do some think tech shows. So I don't know if we're going to be uh, counseling Stan the Energy Man anytime soon. So we'll have more opportunities Excellent. to have we, you back on. You. But thanks for joining oh, us today, Toby. Plan. And, um, and uh, we'll, we'll bring you back on the show later. And thanks to everybody for watching today. Till next Friday, Stan, Energy Man, signing off.